As we open God's word together, let's ask him to bless it to us. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, our Savior, we come to you. Our hearts are cold. Warm them with your selfless love. Our hearts are sinful. Cleanse them with your precious blood. Our hearts are weak. Strengthen them with your joyous spirit. Our hearts are empty. Fill them with your divine presence. Heavenly Father, our hearts are yours. Possess them always and only for yourself. And Spirit of God, open our hearts and minds to hear your voice in the word and empower us to believe, to obey, and to rest in all you teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Please turn with me in Luke's Gospel to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. I want to consider the account of the birth of Christ from Luke's Gospel. Uh, Luke is the third book of the New Testament between Mark and John. It's on page 1090 of many of our pew Bibles, the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. And we'll read the first 21 verses together. So Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse 1 and reading through verse 21. And let's pay careful attention for this is God's own word. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Thus far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. Whenever I think of this passage and preaching this passage, I remember uh, the pastor I had growing up in retirement came back to preach to our congregation, and he said, this is the 17th time I've preached Luke 2 to this congregation. Um, It gave me great hope as a pastor that you can keep coming back to the same passage, preaching different sermons, of course, but always finding something good. And if he could do it 17 times, uh, I haven't done it 17 times yet, but it gives me encouragement to keep coming back to this text. I think the more often we come back to it, the more we can discover there, no matter how familiar it becomes to us. Uh, But this is obviously a great passage to consider uh, for Christmas. One, One of the things that tells us not only about the Savior who came into the world, but why he came. Uh, John Calvin, in one of his sermons on this passage, said this, Merely to know that the Son of God was born on earth does not get us very far. We must also know why He was sent into the world and the benefits He has brought us. To understand these things, we need the witness of the gospel. 
which is why we must pay close attention to what we are told here. The angels announce that with the coming, the coming of God's Son, we may look forward to God's supreme and most costly gift. Their news was not just for one day or for a tiny handful of people. It was intended for all time to the very end of the world. And it was meant for all of us, from the greatest to the least. Now, boys and girls, that means from the oldest to the youngest. Uh, to the end of the world, we need the gospel. We need the good news of a Savior being born. And John Calvin is exactly right. We need to know why Jesus was born and what benefits he has brought to us by coming into the world. And if we want to really summarize that for us, uh, we have a wonderful summary of it in what Mary said in Luke chapter 1, verse 52. Why did Jesus come? What is the coming of Jesus? What does it mean to the world? It means that we are, those of low estate are being exalted. That's what Jesus has come to do. To exalt those of a humble estate. Uh, to raise us up. To be a savior who would turn sinners uh, into saints. Sinners into sons and daughters of our Father in heaven. He's come to exalt us. To lift us up. Um, and we see that particularly in the story of the shepherds. And that's who I want to really focus on together this morning. There's too much in this passage to consider all of it. If you're worried that I might try, don't worry. Uh, we're not going to try to do all of it together this morning. But we want to kind of focus on the shepherds and see how the Lord Jesus has come to exalt those of humble estate. So the first thing we see is the exaltation of the shepherds. Uh, that's the first thing we see in this passage. Then we see the humiliation of the Savior. We need to consider that as well. And finally, we see the elevation of the saved. That's where we want to end our consideration of this passage. The exaltation of the shepherds, the humiliation of the Savior, and the elevation of the saved. Uh, how do we see that playing out in this passage? Uh, well, we're, we're told about these shepherds who are going through an ordinary night's work in verse 8. Uh, we're told about the birth of Christ, then we're told nearby there are shepherds in the field keeping watch over their flocks by night. That's what shepherds do. They're having their ordinary work night, um, watching over the flock that's under their care. And into this ordinary night, uh, something extraordinary happens to them. In verse 9, suddenly an angel appears standing next to them. Um, and the glory of the Lord is shining around him. Uh, that turns this ordinary night into a really extraordinary night. It's a sort of shocking thing that's happened. Only a handful of people in the whole history of the world have experienced something like this. Where suddenly an angel is standing by you and his glory is shining around you. Um, and they have the reaction that we are not surprised to read that they are terrified. Now, maybe those of us who remember back to the King James Version or are familiar with the Peanuts Christmas uh, story, always hear that in the King James Version and think of the shepherds as being sore afraid. Um, they are terrified by what they see. Now, in part because people don't expect an angel to suddenly appear and stand next to them. That's part of the terror, I think, of something so unusual happening, so unlooked for happening. But why else might the appearance of an angel terrify human beings? It always happens. Um, pretty much every time these angels appear, that's what they have to say to people right out of the gate. Don't be afraid. It seems that there is this terror that comes with seeing heavenly beings all the time. It's the universal reaction, in part because it just doesn't happen. Um, it, it's a unique thing to have happen, but also because I think it puts in stark relief the difference between heaven and earth. You're immediately confronted when an angel appears with a heavenly holy being. And it reveals to you that you are not a heavenly holy being. It reveals to you that you are an earthly being. And not as holy as maybe you thought. It puts into stark relief who you are when you're compared with heaven. 
Um, in one of his books, C.S. Lewis kind of imagines a character meeting another character who is truly good. He's sort of an ordinary human being meeting someone who is truly good. And he makes a very interesting description of that meeting. He said he was afraid. And then he explains that fear. At first he was afraid it was an evil thing. Then he realizes it was a good thing, but he was still afraid, and this is why. My fear was now of another kind. I felt sure that the creature was what we call good, but I wasn't sure whether I liked goodness so much as I had supposed. This is a very terrible experience. As long as what you are afraid of is something evil, you may still hope that the good may come to your rescue. But suppose you struggle through to the good and find that it is also dreadful. How if food turns to out to be the very thing you can't eat, and home the very place you can't live, and your comforter the person who makes you uncomfortable, then indeed there is no rescue possible. The last card has been played. Here at last was a bit of that world from beyond the world which I had always supposed that I loved and desired breaking through and appearing to my senses and I didn't like it. I wanted it to go away. I wanted every possible distance, gulf, curtain, blanket, and barrier to be placed between it and me. It's an interesting description, isn't it? What if the goodness, the thing you always thought you wanted, when it finally appears, you realize, wait a minute, I'm not good compared to this. I always thought that world beyond the world was something wonderful, but actually it's something that frightens me. I think that's something that happens when the angels appear. Human beings fear them in part because we realize in their presence that we are unholy. And we realize that they are holy. And everything about their presence communicates to us that however good we are in earthly terms, in worldly terms, there is a vast gulf between what the world calls good and what heaven calls holy. I think that's sometimes what we struggle with when we try to explain sin to the world or when we, people hear our prayer of confession and say, you know, we're not good and there's nothing good in us. It seems like these are pretty nice people here. I mean, I wouldn't say that they're just filled with evil. Is that just sort of a Calvinistic downer? I mean, you're just a professional downer. Is that what this is really all about? But we're saying, no, we're not good when we compare our goodness with heaven. Whatever good we show on earth is nothing compared to the holiness of heaven. It would kind of be like, you know, wearing nice sort of business casual type clothes. That's usually acceptable wherever you go. But then if you stumbled into a formal event where everybody's wearing white tie and tails and ball gowns, it's not, there's nothing wrong with your clothes inherently. But in comparison with what's going on there, you realize, I'm underdressed. I don't really fit here. Um, it's not there's anything wrong, but it's the comparison that shows the difference. I think that's what happens when holy, heavenly beings appear on earth. It shows that whatever we thought was good, whatever we thought was holy, pales in comparison to what is truly good and what is truly holy. It reminds us that we are not fit for heaven as we are. That's what terrifies them. In part, that's what makes them so afraid. And that's also what makes the angel's message so good. Because the angel comes and with that vast gulf that exists between people on earth and heaven, they come and say, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. There is one who's come to bridge that vast gulf that exists between heaven and earth. One who recognizes that you are unfit for heaven as you are. Who has come to make you fit for heaven, who has come to save you. The angel says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. 
right? It's for you, shepherds, but it will be for everyone. It's going to be for the Jewish people who are waiting for a Messiah. It's going to be for the whole world that was promised to be blessed through that Messiah. All the way back in Abraham's day when he was promised that all the earth would be blessed through him, here is the one who is coming to bridge that gulf, to make people who are in themselves unfit for heaven, fit for heaven. The one who's come to be a savior who will save us from our earthly unworthiness and make us fit for heaven. And he will be able to do it because he is Christ the Lord. The angels are speaking of that Savior that these people were looking for for so long. Christ is just the Greek version of Messiah, the anointed one, great David's greater son that was promised who would come and be the Savior of his people and extend salvation from Israel to the ends of the earth. And what the shepherds are being told is, Messiah is here. The Savior has come who is the Christ, the Christ who is the Lord. He is the the owner, the Lord over everything in heaven and on earth. He has now come. He's come into the world to be a Savior, not a judge. To save you from your sins. And he can do it because he is the Messiah. He has the office. He's anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit by his Father. And he is Lord. He himself is the master and owner of everything in this world. He's come to be a Savior. And that Savior they they were always waiting for is here now. Right? He's born to you this day. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. And he's in Bethlehem. He's near, and he's here now. That's the good news of this Savior. And that's why these shepherds are so exalted in the world. No one else received this news. right? They were the ones who were privileged to hear this angelic announcement that the Savior has come. They are privileged to hear the witness of this message, to have it brought to them. People who are low in the world. People who did a profession that was kind of despised in the world. Not people of any note. This is what God has come to do, to exalt those of humble estate. And that's how these shepherds are exalted. Calvin's right. There are many people through the history of the world who have heard this story reported to them. uh, That's come to them through the witnesses. They're privileged to be the witnesses. To see the glory. To hear the angelic voice. And to go and to see the Savior. It wasn't Caesar Augustus who ordered a census of the whole known world at the time and had that power. It wasn't Quirinius who was governor of Syria, authority over that vast region, who heard this news. You could have been Caesar Augustus or the governor of Syria. You never saw anything like this. You never heard anything like this. These shepherds are exalted to be the witnesses who not only hear the announcement of the angel, but hear the heavenly praise that breaks forth. You know, if one angel made them sore afraid, I wonder what happened when the whole multitude of the heavenly host appeared praising God. Um, We're not told that they were afraid. Um, The focus is all on the glory. It's almost as if heaven can't contain the praise of the angels. They have to burst forth and praise the Lord for what he has done. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he's pleased. It's great glory that the shepherds hear. 
But as we see the exaltation of the shepherds in receiving this message, sandwiched in between is a message that shows the humiliation of the Savior. Right? Think about the, the glorious good news that's there um, in the passage. Right? We have a picture of humility that's sandwiched between such great pictures of glory. Right? Suddenly an angel appears, the glory of the Lord is shining around him. He announces that a Savior has been born who is Christ the Lord. Great glory. And then the heavenly host appears, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth among men with whom he's well pleased. Right? A glorious announcement, glorious praise, and what's in the middle of it? A sign of humiliation. What, what is the sign that's given to the shepherds? This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. In between these scenes of glory, we have a scene of humility. A scene of nothing special. You'll find a newborn baby wrapped in ordinary newborn baby clothes and lying in a manger. That's the only thing that will really set this baby apart from other babies. With all apologies to people who have babies, right? That everyone's baby's special, I know that. Um, but if someone just said, now go find a newborn baby wearing ordinary newborn baby clothes, that might not be helpful in terms of identification. Right? But if you say, go look for a newborn baby wearing newborn baby clothes that's lying in a manger, that narrows it down quite a bit. Because presumably in Bethlehem there was only one baby lying in a manger because that's not an ordinary crib. And it's extraordinary but not in a good way. Why is the baby lying in a manger? Why is the Savior of the world lying in a manger? Well, we're told that in verse 7. They laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. Now, whenever the Christmas story is meditated on, people feel the need to expand on all of these details that Luke doesn't give us. Um, that's why you get stables and oxen and donkeys nearby and bowing down to Jesus and Jesus shining in his manger. None of that is here, right? If he was glowing in the manger, they, they could have just told the, the angels could have just said, you know, go and look for the glowing baby. There's only one baby with a halo over his head. That's the, that's the one you're looking for. There's none of that. Luke doesn't give any other details other than they put him in a manger. And why in a manger? Because there was no place for him in the inn. There's no place for him in the inn. The point of that is not to set this scene of a stable or a cave or wherever the animals were, it's to say, why the manger? Because there's no place for him in human society. There's no place for him anywhere else. That really is the point. Jesus will say that specifically in his earthly ministry when people say to him, you know what, I'll follow you wherever you're going to go. I'm excited to follow you. And Jesus says, you, you better count the cost of following me because foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This is the beginning of a life without a place in human society. This is the beginning of a life with no real place here. That should be extraordinary to us. That the Savior, the Son of God, was willing to come into a life like that. Something of the awe of that is in Martin Luther's little Christmas book where he said, there's a manger and that was the first throne of this king. A manger. There in a manger laid the creator of the world willing to come and be so low. And that's important for us because that is how the Savior exalts those of humble estate. How does he exalt those of humble estate and lift them up? By going from his lifted up place and becoming humble. 
joining us in this humble estate that he might lift us up. Think again of the words of Mary in Luke chapter 1, 52 and 53, describing what the Savior will do. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. Right? Great praise for the Savior who's done this. But how does he do it? How does he pull the mighty down from their thrones? By being the mighty one who left his throne in heaven to help. Right? Who fills the empty with good things, the hungry with good things. How did he do that? By becoming hungry. By leaving the good things of heaven to become and join the ranks of the hungry. The rich he has sent away empty. How did he do that? By emptying himself of all the riches he had at his father's right hand and coming into this world to live this kind of life with us. And he will humble himself far beyond this. He will humble himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. Why does the Savior go through such humiliation? That he might join us in our humiliation and lift us up. That he might become like us so that he would make us like him. It's interesting that Luke's account of the birth of Christ introduces to us both notable people and nobodies. Right? There are notable people here. Caesar Augustus, everyone knows who he is. Quirinius of Syria, not everyone knows who he is, but everyone back then knew who he was. Joseph, Mary, the shepherds, who were they then? They were nobodies. Luke presents us with notables and nobodies. And who does Jesus come to associate with? The nobodies. That's who he comes to be a part of. Paul celebrates this fact in 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. When he says, consider your callings, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I don't know if, if you read that sometimes and feel insulted by that. You might feel insulted if we put out on this church sign, come and join our church. We're foolish, we're weak, we're low, we're despised. That might not be great selling points for people to come and join the church. We might not like that that's how we, we are described here. That is exactly who we are according to the worldly standards. And that's okay because that's who Jesus came to save. He came to those who are nothing, to nobodies, who are foolish, weak, low, and despised, so that he could join us and lift us up with him. Because at the end of the day, what does it matter if we are foolish as the world counts foolishness if Christ is our wisdom? What does it matter if we are weak in the world if Christ is our strength? What does it matter if we are low and despised in the world if Christ is our sanctification and redemption? If we are in Christ, we have much to boast of in the world. Nothing in ourselves but all in him. That's what Christ has come to do. 
to enter into our humble state that he might lift us up. Um, And that's where the shepherds are really left in this passage. They come to the Savior in his humiliation and they are elevated as the saved as they go away. Right? The shepherds receive the good news. They respond to the good news in faith. Let us go see this thing that the Lord has done for us and told us about. They report what they'd heard to Joseph and Mary. They go and they find the baby and they report to them everything that's happened. And apparently they go around reporting to everyone they meet what has happened. Right? Joseph and Mary are told uh, what happened. They made known the saying concerning the child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. Right? If we saw an army of angels singing and heard an angelic announcement, we might be tempted to talk to other people about it too. Um, we, we all have stories that we share all the time and people go, oh boy, this again. Um, the shepherds wanted to tell everybody this story. And everybody who heard it was amazed by it. Mary treasured up these things and meditated on them in her heart. But I want to look particularly at what the shepherds do. Um, after they received the good news and responded to the good news and reported the good news, what did they do? They returned to their fields. Martin Luther, with his sort of tongue in his cheek, he can't help poking his eye, uh, poking his finger in the eye of the, Roman, the Romanists of his day. He said, what did they do? Of course, they shaved their heads. They joined a monastery. They became monks because that's what you do when you see something like this. He said, no, that's not what they do. They go back to their fields. They didn't go shave their heads and join a monastery. They went back to their fields. But notice how they go back to their fields. How do they return to their fields in verse 20? The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. There's an interesting pattern that's being repeated in the shepherds that was true of the heavenly host. The heavenly host appeared, then they praised God, they sang glory to God in the highest, and then they returned to heaven. That was the pattern with which they came. Praising God, saying glory to God in the highest, then they return. What do the shepherds do? They return, they glorify God, and they praise Him. You see how this is the reverse of what the angels do? The angels come, they praise, they sing glory, they return. The shepherds return, they glorify, they sing praise. What is, what is Luke doing by picturing that to us? What is the Holy Spirit doing by picturing that to us? He doesn't waste words. There's an important thing being taught here, and it's this. The shepherds have joined the heavenly host. They are doing what the angels did. What that multitude of the heavenly host came and did. Now the shepherds are doing. They have been lifted up to join that heavenly host. Those people, they were unworthy to be around. This is not in the sense of people becoming angels. That's not how things work. People stay people. But they join the heavenly host. They've met the Savior, and that has changed everything. They are not now those who are unworthy of heaven, only fit for this world. They are those who have been qualified to heaven, and what has made the difference? They've met the Savior. They've met the Savior. That makes all the difference. His coming has made all the difference. They have been elevated. They are fit to be part of the heavenly host. And that's what Jesus promises to all those who come to him in repentance and faith. You might not be so bad as the world counts things. But as we are, we are not fit for heaven. Only the Lord Jesus Christ can do that. And that's why he came. He came into the world so that you would know who he is and know why he came and what benefits he has secured for you so that you would believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that by believing you would have life in his name. 
And ever since he came, that's the message of the church. In every age, that will be its message as long as this world remains. That Christ came to save sinners. And he came that you would have life in his name. And that's what the calling still is, to believe in this Savior. To respond in faith. And to experience what these shepherds experience, being exalted out of their humble estate and being brought into their heavenly home by the work of the only one who could do it, the Savior, who is Christ the Lord, Jesus who came to save us from our sins. There's a lot of other things we'll be doing today, but let's not forget that great gift of the Father, a Savior who is still near with us now. And that call to believe and trust in him that we would have life in his name. May God grant that that would be true for all who are here by his grace. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, how thankful we are that the angels came with that message of peace. The coming of Jesus Christ means peace on earth from you in the highest, that from that highest place, You sent your son into the world to be our peace, the fullness of peace. We thank you that he's demonstrated that all who receive this good news are people on whom his favor rests to be privileged to hear that announcement of the gospel. And we thank you that you have given that gospel so that we might have life in your name, so that we might be saved out of our earthly unworthiness. That even though we are not bad people as the world counts bad people, but still as we are, we are not fit for truly good and holy places in heaven. We thank you that our Lord Jesus left that highest place to come and be humbled, to be born in a manger, to have no place in this world so he might give us a place in your house. How thankful we are for providing that you provided to us a Savior. And may we repent of our sins and realize our unworthiness in ourselves and go and look to him. And might we recognize that when we come to him, we find life in his name. That you've given him to us so that we might live. So we might have peace. Peace with you. We pray that you would work so that all of us would know that peace. And for we who do know that peace, would you give us thankful hearts this Christmas day to reflect and remember and praise your name, giving you glory in the highest place for the peace you've sent to earth in your son. Receive our thanks and hear our prayers for we ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take up our Psalters once again as a song of response. Turn to number 303, another Christmas song of Martin Luther's. Uh, Number 303, all praise to you, eternal Lord. We'll stand together and sing all the verses of 303.
Dearly loved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, lift up your hearts now to the Lord and receive his blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be and abide with you all. Amen. Amen. People of God, go in peace.